Welcome to Safe, Efficient, Profitable, a Worker Safety Podcast, where we break down real problems from real situations and discuss realistic solutions. And here's your host, owner of Allen Safety LLC and CHMM, Joe Allen. Good day, this is Joe, and this is about powered industrial trucks. Now, the first time I ever, ever, ever got to be involved with these is not when I was in the military. It's when I became on the civilian side, and two people were driving a forklift towards each other and playing chicken, and neither one of them swerved. And that's the first time I was exposed to the powered industrial truck world. So I was like, well, this is different. This is interesting. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, power industrial trucks today. There's been a lot of events throughout the history. I've worked a lot of events, and what we're going to talk about is just some of the some of the one offs like we have in the other episodes. So as you go through this, think about the randoms. Don't get caught up in how you drive a powered industrial truck. Think about randoms, like maybe the person driving the powered industrial truck has never really drove any vehicle before, or maybe they don't have a license, and maybe they their skills test should have been a skills test and not just a program, answer something online and do a quick drive. So that's that's some of the words that you find out afterwards, after an event or after uh, someone's hit something. So what we're going to do is we'll talk about the program first. Um, Not much on that because everybody has one, but have in there exactly what your training should be. Should it be concept, design, a course, up, down, around a corner, lifting product, whatever it should be? have a good training. To me, training on the power dust truck is probably the most important thing because there's so many people that are walking around or there's so many structures around when people are driving PITs. And it seems like the longer you drive a PIT, the the faster you try to go or you try to do random things. Like we've seen people drive PITs or stand-up lifts and they'll try to be texting while they're driving on the PIT, which is kind of off. And we're like, okay, so maybe you don't have your phone out while you're doing that. And then when it comes to somebody driving a lift, when I do training, I like, because I don't do a lot of forklift training. I spend more of my time evaluating if they're doing processes right, if it makes sense. So what I'm looking for is, does the person show comfort level? Do they show that when they use the forks and drive, it's comfort level. That whenever they pick up the pallet and they tilt it the right way, is it comfort level? That's more important than anything else. It's not about their driving skills. It's about how comfortable they are and how their body moves in that unit. And we talked about that a lot of these episodes about end user and how the person reacts to the surroundings. I also don't like when they do the training where they only do perfect world scenario. What I like to do is have, they're going to do training, set up everything. Basically, if you could take them to the production area on a Saturday or Sunday, when everything's torn apart and you say, all right, this is the obstacle you got to move it in, figure out how to do it today and watch them work in that. Because I think they're going to get more out of that than they are a parking lot with some cones and you go drive around a little bit and say, yes, I'm qualified. Make them do stuff that's hard. If you're going to do a parking lot, go to the boneyard and go to the back of the boneyard of the plant where they've got a whole bunch of extra equipment, extra stuff stored, or extra pallets stored, or cars, or whatever it is out there, and make them do stuff out there and see how they drive. Because you're you're going to have people drive in different environments, and one of them is traffic. So if people are walking by and they're foot traffic, they'll look at where these people go and how they're moving and how much they pay attention. So that's why I look at the training side. I look at make them do it like they would do it for real. Do a job task as a person physically doing it for the end result of not striking or hitting anything while they're doing that particular task. Now, some of the weirdest I look at is the NH3 or the property damage or the struck by items. And what that is, is that I will spend time watching people drive the lift and see where the range is or the height or where the lift's going. I look for that because you will have people that do a particular task all week long and then on Friday afternoon, at the end of the week, they'll go move a bunch of pallets into a particular rack system for storage. And when they do that, they'll hit something that they would never thought of. They'll hit an ammonia pipe or they'll damage another pallet or they will not pay attention and they're backing up real quick and they'll run into a rail supporting another piece of structure. You know, it's end of the day, they're tired, it's the end of the week, they're ready to go, it's final product. Um, and it sounds kind of weird, but I, I spent a lot of time on the worst 
part of their week, worst part of their day when I think they're the most like not really paying attention because I'm trying to manage that risk. So do I put up a barricade, do I block out the aisle? Do we block off different areas where people can't put pallets? Do we guard a, a, a piping system a little better? Whatever it is, gas, ammonia, steam lines or whatever it is. Do we have certain people that when they're tired on a Friday and it's the end of the week, they don't do certain tasks. Maybe we say their task during the rest of the week is fine, but on Friday it ends at two o'clock. They don't do this no more. And someone else comes in who's a little more fresh. And they're the ones that do the stuff that would be a little more critical on how they would put up a pallet or a little more areas of risk they could do. So I, I move people around. I will move the forklifts around. I'll move the product around. Anything I can do to reduce that risk, but I want to evaluate it at the end in the worst case or whatever that is. So I'll ask a lot of questions about that. Now, another thing I look at when it comes to injuries, there's all kinds of stuff online about how injuries are an investigation forklift. I spend my time on how would the injury occur if the person was walking by the lift? So if they're walking behind it, on the side, in front, wherever that is, including me walking by them, I spend most of my time on could that lift cause harm to me in some manner? Do I need to change the route that I'm walking? Do I need to put up a barricade? Um, maybe it's the time of day that the lifts go there from 2 to 3 when no one's walking through there and people are allowed to walk from 12 to 1. Uh, I work in a setting where they go hot and cold so maybe when they're doing hot and cold product where they go into one room or another they may have glasses or they may have some fogging or they may have issues with seeing for a few feet i'm going to recognize those environment changes also so i'm looking because that could affect me walking by there while i'm doing nothing wrong but they can't see as well because it's fogged up and what can i do to manage that or mitigate that so there's not as much harm to it and then the people who were playing the chicken at the beginning of this episode who ran into each other i had never thought about the event side of it of how are we going to secure the two lifts that have been damaged they could still be on is the person that hit with the lift on the right bent the steering wheel but the one on the left was seat belted in but it really wasn't maybe the tightest or maybe it didn't pull on them enough and could they have some injuries so even though our instant investigations we talk about going and looking at a scene on the PIT side, I'm looking more of the structure around it that could also be damaged. Did they hit something else? Is the pallet still on the forklift? Is the product that when they hit each other unstable now that we walk over there, the product could come off the lift and fall and hurt somebody else? And even though we're trying to do goodwill, that we could get injured doing that. So that's kind of where I'm looking at with the injury side of it and with the um and the use. Now another thing I look for is I look for wear and tear and the routine changeovers. What that means is, is the fork thin in the wrong place? Or the, what is the word tires good condition? What is the word um, slightly damaged or damaged? Um, if I'm doing a pre-check form, I want to make sure that, that form is as clear as I can make it so that when someone checks yes, they're safe, and no, they are not, and or no, this line means take it out of service, that they understand take it out of service. Um, now, there's people who like doing the pre-checks during the shift. I personally like having the pre-check done at the beginning of the shift, and the reason I do is because they're on it now. If they do the pre-check in 30 minutes, then it's kind of like they're driving a piece of equipment that they're not really sure if it's working right or not, and I've had people have brakes fail. I've had people that the lighting didn't work right and discover it 15 to 30 minutes later, if they're already and using the piece of equipment and I'm walking by them, I don't want them running over me or hitting me or striking me because of a brake issue. I say the word run over, it could be like go over people's feet. I've seen that where someone's walking through an area and the brake isn't perfect or the guy or gal didn't turn the steering wheel right. And then the, the wheel goes over someone's boot. Well, they can have still toe boots, but it still may not protect them from that. So I'm looking at these different variables. The other thing I look at is the job the, the lift's going to be doing that other control variables could cause it harm. So for example, uh, a forklift is going to load a trailer. They're going to load a trailer. Is the trailer secure enough? Um, is there like some type of lock system up front that manages it? Does the trailer, if it can't have the glide lock, what's it going to have instead? Is it going to have extra cones or extra chocks? Um, is the trailer lit enough inside or is the light busted on the trailer that they can't see in or it, the loading dock area or is the forklift light broken? So if I go to use the forklift in the morning and I don't need the front lights, then I may check it's okay. I go use the forklift later in the day and I'm loading a trailer and I have no lighting in there. Well, now it's not okay. So it's also about knowing where those hazards are and how we're going to adapt to it. 
I spent a lot of time on end result, end use, person doing a task. What are the hazards they can expect? How do we mitigate all we can? Because I want them to do their job. I'll give you an example. If a person is supposed to move pallet one in front of them and go to the left and move it there and go move pallet two and then move it to the left, we want them to stay focused on the actions that they're doing. So what we'll do a lot of times is we will look at the surrounding area, foot traffic, car traffic, whatever it could be around that person, why they're staying focused on task and maybe put up some barrier tape or maybe block off an area by some mechanism or means to tell people, hey, during this time, let's try to keep a few people out of here. Now, I'm not saying it's perfect. I'm not saying you have to do that. I'm not saying there's not other ways to manage it. I just look for ways that work for that area. Sometimes you can block off an area. Sometimes you can't because of other truck traffic. But maybe you change the time of day or maybe you change, you have a spotter outside. There's different things to think of when you're moving product from point A to point B because you want the people doing the tasks to stay focused. That's why I look at it that way. And then the last things I look at is on the injury side. Um, I've had some pretty significant events in my career where people were injured driving a lift. And as they get injured, all I've encouraged you to do is, is pay attention to your training when you do incident investigation and pay attention to your training on your medical response. There's a lot of people I see where they have first aid CPR training. Someone's injured on a forklift. Um, they bent the steering wheel and they're leaning forward. People want to go and move that person back and do an assessment on them. I always encourage people to leave them where they are. Let your medical professionals, your nurses, medics, uh, fire ambulance come on site manage them in the position they are. Yes, if you want to check their pulse, fine. Yes, if you want to see if they're breathing, it's fine. But try not to move them a lot because you don't know how stable or unstable their um, their body is at that moment. And you want to control the scene and manage the area. I also want them to kind of keep all the other traffic away. Don't let anybody else bother them. And we'll talk about instant investigations in later episodes. But just because there's a forklift, sometimes people associate instant investigations like somebody getting hurt on a piece of equipment. I look at it more like with the lift, there's other things that could be in motion. Like I said earlier, it could be the load or the, the, the forks aren't right and they're bent or broke and there's other things that come or a trailer was pulled out and it was able to be pulled out and the forklift came out of it and rolled. And there's videos about that people have seen online and stuff. But the biggest thing is the scene stabilization at that moment is my biggest thing. Most managers of my career deal with events that are a cut or slip, trip, and fall or something like that. But when a forklift's involved and has a, a roll bar or a cage or it has the, the seat belts and everything in place, those people will be in different positions than most people aren't used to. And it's, I spend a little more time on the scene stabilization for that. So yes, it's not really forklift training, but I do spend more time on how do you control the scene if it's an event like that more than just a regular injury if you're going to do instant investigations. So that's something else to look at for clip. And then the last part I want to close with here is that uh, everybody loves the automatic system where you take your ID and you scan it and you say, all right, it does all the pre-checks and you go one, two, three, five, and you hit the pre-checks and you take off. Just watch for the random stuff. And one of the randoms is uh, if it says the forks in operation or if the brakes work, just don't get caught up in the weird stuff. And one of the weird is that, you know, people tell me all the time, we don't ever drive this lift unless you've done the inspection. I said, I don't disagree, but I know you have to move it to do the inspection because you got to check the lift and you got to check how everything's going to work up and down and right and left. And you got to check the brakes, which means you got to drive a little bit. So watch for that. Watch for those little things that how far can you drive it and what can you do before you have to do the pre-check because you'll do it for the inspection. And there's also some devices will have different overrides or different systems, but go back and check your automated system with your fob or your ID that turns it on and try to find out if somebody does have damage, like we said for the instant investigation, and they are hurt in the lift and they've ran into something, can you move that lift without re-signing in? And just ask random questions like that because uh, we've had some of the manufacturers will, will scan in, but you can drive them so many feet at a certain miles per hour before you have to actually be logged in. And that's because if somebody has some damage or harm, you have to be able to move the equipment from them. So just think about that ask about it and work on some of the details. So that's kind of where I'm at today. Um, just a couple of highlights. Like I said, we're doing different episodes every week and we'll be even PITs or, or elevated work or any of these items we've covered. We're going to have other parts to those subjects as the year goes. We just try to give you a few minutes each week to think a little differently and think of one-offs. And then as we go through the year, I've got a list of a bunch of stuff and we're just kind of 
doing as many as we can. Sometimes we have the call in, so people ask questions and I'll try to address that. But the goal of these is to give you a little bit each time, help for your drive or make you think of something different and kind of change up your day. So that's all I have for today. Thank you again for listening. Thank you again for your time. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to Safe, Efficient, Profitable, a worker safety podcast. If you like what you heard here, please take a moment to write us a quick review, like, subscribe, and share our podcast so that others can find us. For questions or to request topics that you'd like to hear on our next show, please visit us at www.allen-safety.com. Thank you.